Welcome students. Tonight we're on lesson seven of the course Foundations for a New Life, Your New Life. And this lesson is entitled, You Have a Helper. Now this lesson will explain how the Holy Spirit works in us and describe various ways in which he works in our daily lives. It will encourage you to experience this power personally. And as always, I hope that you are committing yourself to your daily devotion time. Your, your personal time with the Lord is very important to your spiritual growth for renewal and strengthening for each and every day. I also pray that each of you will be receptive to what God wants to do in your lives and be prepared to spend time asking and seeking God for personal guidance with the help of the Holy Spirit. And this is what our lesson will be about today, the helper that we have, the Holy Spirit. Now let's take a look at our lesson plan for this lesson. You see the introduction on pages 104 through 105 of your study guide. And as you review the introduction, I'd like to stress that without the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life and in the life of the church, there could be no spiritual growth or effective gospel proclamation. I also like to comment that between the time of Jesus appearing to the disciples and other followers on the day of Pentecost, there is no evidence of evangelism conversion, or revival. And though the disciples knew as never before that Jesus was indeed the Son of God and was very much alive, they were not yet empowered to witness to this glorious truth. And that is why the risen Lord instructed them to await the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You'll see a reference for this in Acts chapter 1, particularly verse 8. Now the first section of our lesson is the Holy Spirit is our helper. You'll see this on pages 106 and 107 of your study guide. This first objective asks us to identify the reason why God sends the Holy Spirit to help us. Now as you review that part of your lesson, I, I want you to be able to characterize the Holy Spirit using the following. One, he is God. You'll see an example of this in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. Second, he is the perfection of God. In other words, omnipresence of God. You'll see this in Psalm chapter 139, verses 7 through 10, as well as John chapter 14, verses 16 to 17. We also see that he is omniscient. That means he is all-knowing. You can see a reference for this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13, as well as John chapter 16, verse 13. We can also characterize the Holy Spirit as omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. You can see a reference for this in Job chapter 33, verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. Third, we can characterize the Holy Spirit as a person, not just an influence or a force, as Jesus makes clear in John 16, 13. Some of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit include intelligence. We see this in Acts chapter 15, verse 25, as well as Romans chapter 8, verse 27. He also has will. We can see this in Acts as well. And also when it comes to the scripture in Acts 2 and 4, we can see that he comes as a person. The terms outpouring, falling, and baptized with, and filled with, refer to ways in which he comes into the life of the believer. 
Now I want you to recite John chapter 14, verse 16 and verse 26. As you review those scripture verses, we see that Jesus knew that he would need, that we would need, excuse me, the Holy Spirit to help us live according to God's standard. He knew that we could not live up to the standard that God sets for us in our own strength. Therefore, he sent us this gift of the Holy Spirit. So that first objective talked about the Holy Spirit is your helper. The next section of our lesson talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And you'll see this on pages 107 through 108 of your study guide. The second objective asks us to describe the fruit of the Spirit. Now there's a visual aid for this part of our lesson. If you're studying in a group setting, your instructor will distribute a copy of the visual aid. If you're studying independently, we'll post a copy to your student account or we'll send it to you directly. This, this visual aid asks us to identify which of the fruit of the Spirit have you seen developing in your life since you have come to know Christ. And I also want you to identify which ones you don't see, but would like to see. So this visual aid will help you to examine yourself in light of the fruit of the Spirit. Now I like to ask, where does this fruit come from? What things hinder its growth? We know that the Holy Spirit is the source of the fruit that is produced as we abide in Christ. You can see a reference for this in Romans chapter 5 verse 5 and John chapter 15 verses 4 through 5. We need to understand that allowing the old sinful nature to exercise itself will hinder the growth of the fruit of the Spirit. So let me ask you. What is the significance of the fruit? Well, from our lesson, we understand that it is the evidence of our relationship with Christ. You can see a reference for this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 through 20. We see that the Holy Spirit brings glory to God through us. We can see a reference for this in John chapter 15, verse 8. So that second objective was about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The next objective of our lesson is entitled, Walking in the Holy Spirit. You see this on pages 108 through 109 of your study guide. And this third objective asks us to identify an example of walking in the Spirit. Now I want to have you read Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 26 and as you review that portion of scripture let me ask in light of this passage what does it mean to walk in the Holy Spirit prayerfully you'll see as you examine this portion of your lesson that it is to live by the Spirit or keep in step with the Spirit which means to be sensitive to the Spirit's prompting and leadings so that we can live a life that is honoring to Christ and pleasing to God. I particularly want to focus your attention on verse 17 in the passage that I gave you. This particular verse points out the inner conflict that Christians face as they seek to live a life pleasing to God. And I'd like to explain to you that all Christians experience this tug of war, especially when we are new in the Lord. It may become very intense as we struggle against some old habit or deal with a troublesome relationship. We may find ourselves being pulled in one direction by sinful desires, 
and in the opposite direction by the Spirit. But let me emphasize that we are not helpless pawns in the struggle, but active participants. In fact, our contribution determines the outcome of each particular struggle. So when we, by an act of our will, say no to temptation or to some sinful desire, the Holy Spirit enables us to resist and overcome. Always remember, our will plus the Spirit's power equals victory. So that section of our lesson talked about walking in the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look at our next section of the lesson, which is entitled, The Power of the Holy Spirit in You. You see this on pages 110 through 113 of your study guide. And this fourth objective asks us to choose descriptions of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And as you review that portion of your lesson, let me summarize that the coming of the Holy Spirit as we see in the book of Acts was accompanied with evidence. We see one, Jesus promised the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts 1 and 8. Second, we see the day of Pentecost where all believers were gathered together, about 120 are filled with the Spirit and speak in other languages. You'll see this in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Third, Peter declares with power that this outpouring of the Spirit is a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. You see this in Acts 2, verse 16 through 18. Fourth, we see Peter states that this experience is for all believers then and in the future. We can see this in Acts chapter 2, verse 39. And fifth, we see the Holy Spirit is poured out on Cornelius and his household, and they speak in other languages. We see this in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 46. And sixth, years later, we see Paul prays with some believers at Ephesus, upon whom the Holy Spirit comes, and they speak in other languages and prophesy as well. So we see there were some evidences of the coming of the Spirit as it fell upon or it baptized or filled believers. And in these instances, they spoke in different languages. And in some cases, they prophesied. And when the Holy Spirit falls, it may fall in different ways in our lives. If we are, if we are in a, among those who speak other languages, he may give evidence of his power by giving us the language to communicate his gospel so that they may also praise God as we see in the cases here in the Bible. And so we might describe the baptism of the Holy Spirit as such a deep surrendering to the Holy Spirit that he enables us to praise God in a language unknown to us, or we may, as Paul taught, sometimes pray in the Spirit. And this is a gift of God that is available to all believers, it allows you to have direct communion and fellowship with God by the Holy Spirit praying in you and praying through you. So that section of our lesson talked about the power of of the Holy Spirit in you. The next section of our lesson talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We see this on pages 114 through 115 of our study guide. And this fifth objective asks us to identify truths about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now as you look at this section of your lesson, I want you to observe that some people seem to emphasize the gifts of the Spirit over the fruit of the Spirit. But this should not be the case. The difference between the fruit and gifts is this. Fruit bearing is a sign of spiritual growth 
whereas spiritual gifts are sovereign gifts by God upon individuals which has little to do with their spiritual maturity. You see, God bestows gifts or ministries for the purpose of enhancing the witness of the church. But we must have the fruit of the Spirit in order for us to grow spiritually, to manifest God's love, His joy, His peace, His goodness, kindness, temperance, faithfulness, and self-control. So it's important for us to understand that both the fruit and the gift of the Spirit are manifestations of God's power. One doesn't happen without the other. But the one that must take place is the fruit usually produces the gift of the Spirit. Now there's also a visual aid for this section of our lesson. And the same procedure will follow. Your instructor, if you're in a group setting, will distribute a copy of it. If you're studying independently, we'll send you a copy to your account or directly. And this particular visual aid asks us to distinguish between the two categories of the gifts of the Spirit. The first part that this visual aid talks about are permanent placements in the church for the purpose of equipping the saints to fulfill the Great Commission. We see an example of this in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. And we see that he listed apostles who function as messengers or spokesmen of God. In apostolic days, it referred to a select group who carried out directly the ministry of Christ. In our day, it refers to those who have the spirit of apostleship in performing the work of of the early apostles in the body of Christ by sharing the gospel in places where it had not yet been preached and establishing bodies of believers as a result. We see listed prophets and they speak as the direct mouthpiece of God for the correction, edification, and strengthening of the church, the body of Christ. We also see listed evangelists who exercise a special gift of preaching or witnessing that brings unbelievers to salvation. Next, we see listed pastors who nurture and care for the spiritual needs of the local church. See, pastor, the word pastor comes from the root word to protect, from which we get the word shepherd. Next, we see listed teachers who are used to explain with supernatural ability and apply spiritual truth as revealed in God's Word. And this requires study along with the Spirit's illumination and is necessary for all of these gifts that we have just listed. Next we see the gifts of the Spirit as talked about as available to all believers and it is bestowed by the Holy Spirit as he wills we don't decide which gifts manifest in us God decides which gifts to grant us or bestow upon us we'll see an example of this in Romans chapter 12 verses 4 through 8 as well as 1st Corinthians chapter 12 verses 8 through 12 and another example is found in 1st Peter chapter 4 verse 10 and here are some of the ways in which the gifts may manifest through prophesying which is divinely inspired and anointed utterance in a known language and available by faith to all who have the infilling of the Holy Spirit we can see this example in 1st Corinthians chapter 14 verses 3 to 5 as well as verse 31 we also see that the gifts may manifest in unknown languages languages that are not learned through natural ability through us so unknown tongues or languages is the God-given ability to speak forth in a language unknown to the speaker 
and that praises God, that exalts God, and that communicates God's message to those in, in their own language. It may also be used to communicate to the local church or to individuals. We can see examples of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, verses 28 to 31. You also see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. Also through verses 4 through 32. We see examples of how languages or unknown tongues were used to communicate the gospel to the church. We next see listed interpretation of tongues, which is the supernatural ability to reveal the meaning of a message in tongues so that the whole church is strengthened and built up. So faith, the God-given ability to rely totally on God without doubt in a specific area of concern. That's another gift that we see manifested in the church through the gifts of the Spirit. We also see working of miracles, which is the supernatural power to intervene and counteract earthly and evil forces. It operates closely with the gift of faith and healings to take authority over sin, Satan, sickness, and bind the forces of the darkness. Next we see listed some of the gifts, the gifts of healing, which is the God-given ability to heal people of illnesses of any kind, but not discounting God's use of human instrumentality or the use of medicine. Next we see as the gifts of the Spirit is called discerning of spirits which is the God-given ability to determine whether a supernatural manifestation has its source in God or Satan. Next we see the word of wisdom, which is supernatural insight into God's will and purpose, being led by the Spirit to act appropriately in a particular circumstance. And we also see listed the word of knowledge, which is the God-given ability to know certain information about an individual or circumstance in greater detail than is possible with the human mind. And there are other gifts that are also listed. We see giving is listed as a gift in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2 and verse 7. Also, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11 to 13, shows the gift of giving. We also see the gift of mercy and helps, listed in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. We see the gift of celibacy. It's listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 7 through 9, and verse 27. Also, you can see this listed in Matthew chapter 19, verses 10 through 11. In addition to Revelation, chapter 14, verse 4. We also see listed the gift of missionary in Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. We see the gift of hospitality listed in 1 Peter, chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, as well as Romans, 12 and 13. It's also listed in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 2. And then we see the gift of martyrdom and listed in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12, Acts chapter 7 verse 59 to 60, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 6 to 8, and then we also see listed the gift of leadership in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. So there we have covered the final section of the lesson which talks about the gifts of the Spirit 
and the ways in which they manifest themselves. I certainly pray that this lesson has been a blessing to you and that you'll refer to it often to understand that you have a helper. This is Lesson 7 of the Course Foundations for New Life. And so we've talked about the Holy Spirit is our helper, talked about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, walking in the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit in you, and then the gifts of the Spirit. And we talked about some of the ways they manifest as the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. We talked about some of the various gifts, prophesying, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, working of miracles, discerning of spirit, wisdom, words of wisdom, word of knowledge, and many other gifts that we talked about in this lesson. So as we conclude, I, I want each of you to be eager to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some of you still may remain skeptical. In either case, I want you to review the portions of Scripture that we've given you in this lesson to see the testimony and witness of the Spirit falling upon or filling the believers or baptizing the believers. I can personally attest to the fact that once the Holy Spirit comes upon our lives, His omniscience, His omnipresence, it starts to manifest. If He reveals things to us that we would not normally just understand. He reveals things. So he reveals the clarity and gives illumination through the Word of God to us. That has been my personal experience. And I, I know that God wants to also reveal himself to you in a special and dynamic way. So seek God. Seek him personally for the gifts and the baptism and the filling of the Holy Spirit to be manifested however God chooses to work through you. And I thank God that each of you have studied these lessons and I pray for the powerful impact of the Holy Spirit to be in and upon your lives. We're going to be praying for all of those who are seeking the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit that he fall afresh upon you even as you listen to this lesson, as you pray, as you meditate. I also want to encourage you to seek to receive the gifts of the Spirit by faith and knowing that our motive is to honor God and to edify the church, it is not used, it is not sought after to draw attention to ourselves. And I also like to remind you that the fruit of the Spirit grows out of your close relationship with the Lord. And this involves daily prayer, Bible reading, fellowship with other saints, and entering into the flow of worship and praise in the Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to manifest in your life in these ways. And so we thank God for each of you, and we trust and believe that the Holy Spirit will manifest in your lives as you seek Him and as you surrender your lives to Him. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen. Now let me give you our assignment for our next lesson, lesson number eight, by asking this question. How does your lifestyle reflect your relationship with Jesus Christ? And I want each of you to pray this week for an opportunity to witness to someone through your actions and through your words. Here's the memory verse I want to give you for next week's lesson. Is Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 and verses 16, which state, You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Lord, we thank you today for allowing us to study this lesson about the Holy Spirit, our helper. Be with each student and each person under the sound of my voice. Help them to understand and embrace the special gift 
that you have given to all those who surrender their lives to you. Help them to receive and believe for the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit to work in their lives, to work through them, to bring glory to you, Father, to edify the church, and to draw others to you. And we bless you in advance, and we thank you even now. In Jesus' name, amen.